Well, please grab your Bibles. You can turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. This is a passage, a portion of Scripture that we could spend months preaching through, uh, but it's a passage really that takes a lifetime to apply. We're going to study verses 1 through 16 this morning. Obviously, we won't be able to go into every uh, minute detail, but my priority this morning is for us to capture the big picture, and I believe that it is what would be most helpful to us as a church together. Well, before we dive into this, let's pray and seek the Lord's help. Lord, you know that the more we understand your word, the more we're overwhelmed by its wisdom. The more that you help us see Christ, the more we're overwhelmed by his unfailing love and undeserved kindness. Lord, you know that as I stand before you, I'm overwhelmed with love for these people, for these brothers and sisters who are here with me. And so I pray that you would then use me to speak the truth in love. Oh Lord, bring us to maturity in Christ. Bring us to unity in Christ. Oh Lord, help us, strengthen us, equip us for every good work, for the glory of your name in the church, in Christ Jesus forever, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, in one context or another, you may have heard about these four people. Uh, they've happened to attend church this morning, and I want to draw attention to these four people. Their names are um, everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. See, the church had a need, and everybody was asked to help. But everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but you probably know who did it. Nobody. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. And on and on it went with these four people. For whenever work was to be done, nobody could always be counted on. And in short, nobody was a very faithful member. And the day came when somebody asked the pastor if anybody would disciple him. Well, the pastor replied, no, everybody is too busy. And frustrated and shocked, the man said, seriously, nobody will meet with me? And at that point, the pastor stood up from his chair and looked out his window and said, no. Because when everybody's busy, nobody disciples anybody. Nobody disciples anybody when everybody's too busy. That's a disheartening reality. It may be somewhat comical in regards to beginning a sermon, but it's, it's discouraging when it's true. When everybody's too busy, nobody disciples anybody. And I want to ask you, what is it going to take, Cornerstone, to ensure that that can no longer be said of us as individuals or of a congregation? How can we grow in linking arms together? How can we walk side by side to foster a culture of faithful discipleship in the body? Maybe one, you could even say, in which everybody is discipling everybody in some capacity. I think that Ephesians chapter 4 actually supplies us with a helpful solution. Because it speaks to the body life. It speaks to the life of the church in which people, Christians, participate in the lives of one another for the sake of doing spiritual good to each other. That word participation is the 
the word I want you to remember today. It's the key word for this morning, participation. See, two weeks ago, we looked at Philippians chapter 3, and we learned about imitation, in that everybody is commanded by Christ to find someone to follow and then to become someone to follow. And then last week in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we learned about devotion. That is that everybody in the church is called by Christ to a life of loyalty, of unfailing allegiance to King Jesus. And so here this morning then from Ephesians 4, we want to see participation. For following Jesus is more than being present in a building. It's about participating in a body. That's what God's word will show us this morning. Particularly because discipleship is not a spectator sport. It, in fact, requires crowd participation. See, according to the New Testament letter of Ephesians, the church is where this discipleship happens. Now, the global church is one thing, but it expresses itself locally in gatherings of saints, united together in truth and in the gospel, under the oversight of spiritual shepherds and servants, working together to worship God and to advance the truths of Christ's kingdom. That church, that community of saints, this body is where we learn to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called. It is the place in which we pursue a vibrant walk with God and help others to do the same. In short, it's a place where discipleship takes place. And I, I'm curious if you're convinced of that. I love how Mark Dever said it. He, he said, the local church, this father-designed, Jesus-authorized, spirit-gifted body is far, better to is far better equipped to undertake the work of discipling believers than simply you and your best friend. In other words, you and your best friend just hanging out for coffee. It, it's beyond that. He says, Jesus does not promise that you and your one friend will defeat the gates of hell. He promises that the church will do this. And so, friends, I want you to see the church is not a solo act. Discipleship is not a solo act. It is a symphony of service where each one is called to join in. You might say where each one is called to participate. For our time this morning in Ephesians 4, I want to give you four words that capture four ways you can participate. Four words for four ways you can participate in our body. You can help us cultivate a culture of discipleship here. The first word we see in verse 1 is consistency. Consistency. We are to pursue consistency. Paul kicks off this so what section here in chapter 4 with a strong call to pursue a lifestyle that fits the faith. You might say that chapters 1 through 3 are what's true of us in Christ. Chapters 4 through 6 then are what we are to do as those in Christ. And so he says in response to all this, this divine grace and mercy that's been given to you freely, yet at the cost of Christ's own life, verse 1, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you. That's, I urge you. I appeal to you. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Now, what does it mean to walk worthy? That's the primary command here that Paul gives. Walking worthy. Let me try to capture it with a few uh, expressions. Think about a chef sneezing on your food. Yeah. Think about a drunk driver going 100 miles an hour on an icy interstate. Think about a, an Olympian using performance-enhancing drugs, a judge accepting a bribe. Think about a Marine who abandons his duty in cowardly fear. Think about a celebrity pastor living a luxurious life, the cost of being above reproach. Think about an 
international apologist committing and covering up egregious acts of sexual immorality. All of that is behavior that is inappropriate, that is inconsistent with the calling. And so it is here that Paul, through the, by the Holy Spirit, calls us to walk worthy. That doesn't mean to live perfectly. It doesn't mean to live in such a way that you make yourself worthy of God's grace. That's not what he's saying. Simply put, it means conducting your life in a way that aligns or fits with the truths that you say you trust. It's to pursue a life of consistency, one that consistent with our calling into grace and that reflects the character of the one who called us into that grace. Now, one thing that might be telling of our time that helps us really understand what Paul's trying to emphasize here is just think about this. If I told you to use the, if I use the illustration of something like this, a politician who tells the truth, you kind of chuckle, right? That's inconsistent, right, in our minds. That is proof in which a dignified office has fallen under reproach. It has been disgraced by unbecoming behavior. That's what Paul is saying. Because for many people, believers and unbelievers alike, that's exactly what they hear, they think, they believe when they hear Christians. Somebody who doesn't live in a way that aligns with what they say they believe. I mean, I can think of my grandpa. On his deathbed, essentially weeks before he was about to die, I went to talk to him about the gospel, and my attempts got shut down. Do you know why? Because there were a few farmers in his community who said they were Christians and yet who were liars and cheats. And so he didn't want to hear anything about the gospel, about Jesus, at the moment in which he was about to go stand before Jesus because the testimony of those men was inconsistent. I can tell you that I have dear brothers and sisters who are sitting next to you who share with me through tears Often, how inconsistent living of other Christians has had a devastating, sometimes seemingly irreversible impact on them. And they don't know what to do with it. Even this week, I was at a coffee shop and I ran into a Christian man that I hadn't seen in years. And literally, within the first 60 seconds, I'm not kidding, within 60 seconds... This man began to criticize my role and my calling. He began to immediately judge me and for things that I, other pastors had done that I had not done. <laughs> and it was a good thing for both of us that I was preaching Ephesians 4 because <laughs> I was able to calmly take that down and not get out of control for myself. But I thought, that is the inconsistency that I'm talking about. Because the older that I get and the more ministry that I do, the better I understand why this is the first and main command. After all that rich doctrine of Ephesians 1 through 3, walk. Because inconsistency, whether big or small, can do tremendous harm to our relationships inside the church and do tremendous harm to our reputation outside of the church, right? You know this too well. I know that saints are sinners and we always will be. So inconsistency of some sort will always remain. But God willing, we will grow. Resting entirely upon the grace of God, we want to strive in the Spirit's power to align our behavior with our beliefs. To let our ways match our words so that neither Christ nor his church are disgraced. You can say it that Inconsistency is repulsive at best, and it's destructive at worst, utterly destructive. So by way of application, I want to invite you to do three things. First, I want to invite you to join 
with me in lamenting. We should read this text and be sad. All the ways that we personally and we collectively have disgraced the name of Jesus before the eyes of others. We should grieve that. And yet, second, we should, we should remember that Jesus paid for every failing. I want to remind you, Jesus, wasn't, Jesus isn't surprised by the sinfulness of his people. He knew for whom he came to die. He's not caught off guard by it. But his heart is that we would freely confess. We would bring these things into the light. In fact, I want to actually invite anybody here who you feel like you've been inconsistent. I want to invite you to come into the light, to confess these things, and to see the grace of God in your life. That what it looks like to repent of these things and to put on a new life in him, we want to walk together in doing that. Because sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes the only thing that's inconsistent in my life is inconsistency. Let us be those who are readily, freely confessing, for Christ freely supplies that forgiveness we need. And then I want to encourage you to renew a grace-fueled effort to put off hypocrisy and to put on that which fits with the faith. 1 John 2.6 says, By this we may know that we are in him, in Christ. Whoever says he abides in Christ ought to walk in the same way as he walked. So church, the first way we can participate in cultivating a healthy discipleship culture here is to pursue consistency. By God's grace, pursue consistency, walk worthy. But a key part of doing this is to remember and to preserve our unity. That's our second word, unity. Unity, preserve unity. In reality, the entire section of verses 1 through 16 here fall under this heading of unity. That's what Paul is emphasizing. But in verses 2 through 6, he gets to the heart of unity, like literally and uh, in an illustration way. Read verses 2 through 6 with me. So again, we're to walk worthy, right, in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called, verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. For one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Cornerstone, do you see that the worthy walk that participates in the life of the church, it begins with understanding what unites us and how we are to live together in that community. Our union is a spiritual union, not one that we have created, but one that we're called to maintain and preserve. And the way we express it is interpersonally or relationally, for it's based on our doctrine or our theology. I want to highlight those two those two aspects of our unity. Verses two through three speak of our relational Unity, that is how we're to live in community together. He begins with all humility and gentleness. In other words, we are to relate to each other humbly and gently. That word humility is the word for lowliness. It's to have an accurate view of yourself. That means one that's not too high, nor one that is too low. That word gentleness is meekness. Meekness is not weakness, has rightly been said. That word captures or expresses power that's harnessed under control, and it's directed for good. Did anybody, oh, not did anybody, how could we have not noticed that windy day we had this last week? Did you guys catch that? Yeah, we had to like lock our doors and put a sign up because it was blood. This word expresses something like a a soft breeze. Like the wind can be incredibly destructive when it's full force, isn't it? But when it's gentle and soft, it's actually very enjoyable. That's what this word is. Paul's getting at the heart of saying arrogance and abrasiveness undermines our unity. It sabotages our relationships. 
And just by weight of observation, I want to note that these are the exact same words that Jesus uses of his heart in Matthew chapter 11 when he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So Paul is saying that we ought to reflect that heart of Christ, that disposition towards each other, such that when you come to me, you in some way, by God's power, experience Christ in me. When you go to one another, you experience the heart of Christ for each other. He speaks about humbly and gently, and then he talks that we are to live patiently and peaceably. He says, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Patience is a word that means peace while waiting. It's like you don't pop like a balloon when you're provoked. When something pricks you like a sharp word, you don't explode. You endure. In verse 2, it's nuanced with bearing with one another in love. To communicate that we are to put up with one another. We're to endure each other. Put up with what irks us about each other. Which is basically what it means to be a family, right? Our love is patient. It's unhurried. Because we are actually hurrying to something else. That word eager... To maintain, it means to be diligent or take great pains. Make it your full focus, main concern. It means that you hurry towards maintaining unity. We don't have to hurry one another's growth along because what we're hurrying along to is patient peace. Remember, Paul is writing as a prisoner. He's shackled in a jail cell. And what illustration does he use? This bond, this chain of peace. Now don't think of this like the old ball and chain <laughs> uh, marriage expression. That's not what we're talking about in the church. Though sometimes it may feel difficult. Yes, it will be difficult. Think of it more like those uh, kids ropes. You know, that put the harness on the, on the kid at Disneyland and you walk around or you put Put it on your wrist. I remember being a three or four year old at Disneyland with it or on my wrist. I hadn't put that tether on my wrist, but it was my responsibility to make sure that that tether didn't break. It was my responsibility to stay close to my mom and dad because they loved me and they protected me and they were for my good. And so too, church, we, we maintain this union that was made by the Spirit by staying close to one another, staying close to the Lord. And we strengthen it, we fortify this bond by living humbly and gently, patiently and peaceably. And from there, Paul begins to build on this illustration, talking about these mutually treasured truths. If, if that's how we're to relate to one another, if we're going to walk worthy consistently, then he says, this is this is why you're relating to one another. Here's, here's what you share in common. It's these beliefs we have in our community together. Verse 4, there is one body. So he's about to use this body illustration, right? In chapter 2, Paul spoke about the church as a building with Christ as its cornerstone. In chapter 5, he'll speak of the church as a bride with Christ as her husband. But here in, verse, in chapter 4, he speaks of the church as a body, with Christ as its head, we as members of one another. And just like a body has one spirit, so too the body of Christ has one spirit, that is the Holy Spirit. We press on to one hope, that is the hope of glorious salvation when sin is fully gone and all things are made new. First Peter says we've been born again to a living hope and we press on to this hope and we do it until we're all united in him. It says that we have one Lord, that is Jesus, our meek master. One faith, that is the body of truth and practice that all Christians hold true and hold dear. Delivered to us, defended by us, it is one faith. There's one baptism, 
Some people disagree on whether this means baptism in the water or just baptism into the body of Christ. I think it leans towards that view of this is being baptized into the body of Christ. As you believe in Jesus, you're immersed into the body by the Spirit. But that is expressed as we testify to it through water. And then ultimately he says there is one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. This Father, our Father, is over all things. And so he's, you might say that he's using these seven different links in one chain of divine doctrine that we commonly confess. Now let me just take a step back and give you the full picture of what he's saying. This is what he's saying verses 2 through 6. Our unity is based on what we believe and it's maintained by how we live. We acknowledge our lowly place before God and from that heart posture we then relate to one another gently, lowly, peaceably, patiently. We endure what's difficult and annoying and hard to love, even hurtful in each other. We choose to cover a multitude of sins and shortcomings with gospel-informed love. We're not focused on what's wrong with one another because we're so busy focusing on what Jesus is up to in one another's lives. We don't have to spend our days biting and devouring. No, we spend them building one another up because we are diligently preserving that blessed tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. Now, everybody... Everybody, every, everybody, I separated those words. Every body, every church body suffers from an autoimmune disease in which the body attacks itself. Yet the way we fight against that is not with aggression, but by humbly and gently admonishing the kinds of arrogance and abrasiveness, by speaking truth to one another in love, into actions and attitudes that are inconsistent with Christ's heart and conduct, we bring the presence of Christ by the authority of his word and with the gentleness of the Savior. And yet there are times for strong correction. For there are times in which loving one another is very costly, painful, but as we walk together, we become a real-time, enfleshed answer to Jesus' prayer in John 17, that they may all be one. That doesn't mean we'll all be the same, but it does mean that we will be united. Let, just think about it for a second with me. Unity is what came to Paul's mind when he thought about a worthy walk. What's the first focus that you should have as a Christian, Paul? Surely there's all these things to do, right? He says unity. That's convicting. How far have we fallen from the heart of Christ? Unity is kind of like a banned book in our circles, isn't it? It's like a curse word almost. It reeks of compromise, theologically and morally. And it's right because it, it often does. That's correct. It does lead to compromise at times. But surely, surely if the heart of Christ was about the unity of his people, surely if Paul's exhortation first and foremost is the unity of of, his bo of the body of Christ. Surely our first reflex to the word should reveal that we have many things to repent of. I was thinking about it. Some of our favorite pastors still at the end of their ministry can't even be together for the gospel. What a, what disappointment. And yet we're not immune to that, are we? We often do the very same thing. And so church, I want to encourage you by way of application to give some humble, honest, sober thought to the way that you have been the disease. To the way that we, in our own ways, 
have undermined the unity that Christ died to buy, is working to create, maintain, bolster. How have you been eroding our unity instead of preserving and protecting it? I ask humbly, what have you, think about what we've said and done behind closed doors. Think about what we've said and done about each other in the privacy of our own thoughts. Or as we've typed with digital courage or regrettably set out in the open thinking nobody was listening. Love, let's repent. Let's repent. And with the Spirit's help, let's resolve to be different. To do everything in our power to preserve this unity. Because Christ, you could say, from this text, desires that his body would have his heart. May we who love deep truth deepen our love for one another. That's a second way we can participate. Preserve unity. Preserve unity. My time is getting a little bit short, so I want to press on here to our third, our third word. That is ministry. Verses 7 through 12 talk about practicing ministry. There was consistency, unity, now ministry. Verse 7 says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. That's a quote from Psalm 68. In saying this, verse 9, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So here Paul moves from what we have in common in our unity to what we differ in, our diversity. That is the diversity of our giftings and of our callings. And he explained that God is the sovereign dispenser of gifts, for he is the one who has designed our unity to be comprised of diversity. Now, Paul quotes Psalm 68 here to prove one specific point. There's a lot of uh, scholarly ink that's been sh spilled on these verses here. And I'll, I'll leave that for another sermon. Or if you want to talk to me about them afterwards, I'd be happy to. But Paul is making a point, and I don't want it to be lost on us. His point is that Jesus Christ, who dwelled eternally as the word of God in heaven. He became incarnate. You might say that he from whom heaven came, he sought her, the church, to be his holy bride. And with his blood he bought her and for his life he died. And then as he descended in that sense, he then rose again and ascended into heaven as a victorious king. The picture here is that of an ancient king Ancient kings would go off to war, and then in their homecoming, as they came back into the city, it would include a processional or a parade of all the spoils of war. It was paraded on display for all the community to see. And then all these gifts and spoils were distributed for the people's enjoyment. Paul's saying, in a greater more marvelous, more mysterious way, Christ, our gracious King, descended from heaven, put on flesh, lived a blameless life according to the law of God, then went to the cross where he bore our curse, then he rose again on the third day, and then in crushing the serpent's head, he ripped the doors off the city of death, those chains fell to the floor, and he set all of those who were enslaved in sin, he set those captives free. And so captives to sin and darkness become captives to Christ and light. And in that way, as Jesus ascended into heaven to seat us at, to be seated at the right hand, and then according to Ephesians 1, seat us with him in Christ in the heavenly places. It is the same one, it is that Christ who gives the gifts to his church body 
for the purpose of service and ministry. And it turns out, church, that the gifts he gives are people. The gifts he gives to his own church are people. That's why in those verses, specifically verse 11, you get the apostles and the prophets. You get the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers. All of these are different roles and offices in the church. They're not necessarily attitudes or personality types, as some might see them. They're roles and offices. The apostles and prophets, according to Ephesians 2.20, form the foundation of the church with Christ as the cornerstone. And so this is a reference to those who had pioneered the gospel originally, those who spoke the word of God originally. But just as you don't build multiple foundations on a house, these were reserved and only for that initial building. And so we wouldn't see these two offices as continuing. Then you have these evangelists. Think gospel heralds. Think missionaries, church planters, people who fish for men for a living. And then you have the shepherds and teachers. Some people see two offices here, shepherds and teachers. Some see one. Either way, these are reference to men who oversee the flock of God, leading, feeding, guiding, guarding, protecting, providing, living above reproach while they equip the saints for the work of the ministry by teaching the word. To help illustrate this, I I can't help but share with you an illustration that Alistair Begg um, spoke one time. And I want to reimagine it a little bit and set it for you, but... Imagine that you're at a concert hall with a symphony on stage. And the conductor stands up and he welcomes you and says, we're going to have a great night. And then instead of turning and conducting, he goes over to the first chair violin and like pushes her off the chair. And is like, give me that violin. And then starts playing a little fiddle or something on it. And then he runs around back to the big, uh, big bass drum and just gives it a bang, a huge bang goes over then back down to the oboe and plays a little bit of a theme from the mission. Gabriel's oboe. Goes around to the brass and the, over then to the piano and plays some chopsticks on it. Suddenly it's just chaos in this concert hall. You'd look at that man and you go, that guy's crazy. <laughs> he should be fired. He can't play all those parts. He, he's not meant to play those parts. Why would you say that? You'd say that because that's not his role. That's not what he's meant to do. Others can play each of those instruments better than he can. Music sounds best when everybody playing their own instrument, their own part, plays in concert together. And so, Cornerstone, I hope that you will see that the church designed by Christ himself is designed as a symphony of service in which we all play our parts in concert together. Church, I can just speak personally. We, we want to shepherd you well. We want to equip you for the work of ministry that you are doing. But I realize that you can't do what you're called to do if I'm not doing what I'm called to do. Maybe I'd say it a different way. You can't do what you're called to do if I'm doing what you're called to do. And for that, I want to ask for your forgiveness. For the ways in which my own arrogance, I've attempted to kick you off the tuba and play it myself. You know, like, I shouldn't be doing that. That grieves me that that we at times can take your instruments and play them for ourselves because we think they'll sound better if we do it. That's wrong. Yet it's also true that we can't do what we're called to do if you're trying to do what we're called to do. And so for the sake of the benefit of our body, I want to ask you if you would recognize and turn away from some of the ways you might be tempted to play pastor, whether in public or in private. I want to encourage each of us to play our parts because honestly the better illustration is probably that Christ is sitting there conducting And I'm just over there on the harp, like just doing dangly things. Or I'm over in the corner 
trying to chop something out. Maybe I'm like that whistling person <laughs> with the good, the good, the bad, and the ugly over there. I want to encourage you, beloved, to join in and participate by carrying out your ministry, proactively seeking ways to serve, not just on Sunday, but in the body every day. There's so much good ministry to be done, and it's, it's work, but it's worth it. I want to ask you and invite you to come do that. And then let me close here with our fourth, fourth point, our last point, and that is maturity. Maturity. We are to promote maturity. That's the goal of it all. Look at verse 13. Until, right, we're to be doing these things, until we attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Verse 15, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That's where we end. Individuals united to Christ and united to one another, maturing together as they minister to one another. That will only happen when each of us, playing our own part, are working properly. Now that could look like a hundred different things, but I want to help you discover what that would look like here in our church body. And I want to help some of you help other people <laughs> discover that as well. Ultimately, we want to build ourselves up in love into the maturity that Christ calls us to. So we're not tossed aside. We're not theological infants persuaded by the error of every new fad that blows our way. No. But speaking the truth in love, we promote maturity. We, we get into the spiritual gym together as we minister to each other through the word. And I want to make a note that verse 15 is preceded by verses 2 through 3. And so if we're going to speak the truth in love, let's remember the heart needs to be right before the tongue speaks. Because truth without love is brutality. Love without truth can be said to be dishonesty. We disciple one another with our words. We minister to each other, aiming for maturity. I just want to praise God here that we are a growing body. I rejoice in that. Part of the question I've been asking myself, are, are we a grade schooler who's just kind of excited to finally have a lunchbox and backpack? Uh, are we a middle schooler who has some of the basic truths right but are convinced it's kind of impossible for us to be wrong? If I was honest, I, I think that maybe we're somewhere around a teenager. I find a lot of parallels. Our pimples are there no matter how hard we try to cover them up. We feel growing pains in our bones, and both our jeans and our bed are too short for us. They don't fit us anymore. We're not entirely comfortable in our own body. We're still developing coordination and discovering our identity. We ask a lot of good questions, but we often think we already have the answer. We like having our friends over to the house more than we like being with our siblings. We think life is so busy right now and there's no time to do what matters. And we need to pick up our room before dad gets home. Like a teenager, we've got a lot going for us, a lot of good. We have a lot of maturing to do. So let's flourish together. Let's discover that Jesus is better than everything in every way. And to that end, let's press on to pursue consistency, to preserve our unity, to practice ministry, and ultimately to promote maturity. Let's participate in the life of the body. I end with the words of Psalm 34, verse 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Let's pray. Lord, we do exalt in you and your goodness. You have granted to us a salvation that is 
hard to fathom. Such love, such mercy towards sinners. How I pray then, Lord, that even through our time together, that there would be some in this room who would turn from their sin and trust in Jesus for the very first time. They would come to know Christ as Savior and Lord. And they would be welcomed into this body of believers. Oh Lord, teach us to be humble yet consistent. Help us to put off hypocrisy and to put on a life in which we preserve our unity. Loving one another with the right heart and the right words. Ministering to one another as you have called us. And pursuing maturity together. Oh Lord, for the glory of your name in our church and the glory of the gospel as it advances into the world. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.